It seems to me that Adam State does not want anyone to rock the boat. If you do not agree with the powers that be, things can become rather hostile. It's, it's almost like you're a troublemaker if you speak out and express your opinion. Welcome to another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. Today we're being joined by Elaine Regan, who is a former nursing faculty at Adams State University. She shares her experiences in creating much of the coursework that the nursing program was getting off the ground, and how overworked she ended up feeling between her coursework, clinicals, university service, and any small attempt at having a life outside of her work. She goes on to talk about how she was made to feel as though she were a troublemaker for raising her concerns, and how some even found her efforts to have these issues addressed as threatening. So please join us for another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. Okay, my name is Elaine Regan, and I have been a certified nurse midwife for 37 years. That said, I officially retired uh, this past summer, so I am no longer working. I have been involved in women's health care um, for most of my career. I've done a lot of teaching in a number of different facilities, um, Adam State being one of them. Um, I have two master's degrees. One is in nursing and one is in community health education. Um, I was also certified as a forensic nurse, a sexual assault nurse. I was a sexual assault nurse for eight years in Albuquerque. Um, I did over 300 sexual assault cases, and I really loved that job. It, it kind of was balanced with my labor and delivery, which was my specialties, labor and delivery. That's kind of it in a nutshell in terms of, of my career. Great. So it sounds like you had a, a pretty varied career even before you got into teaching. Can you talk about what attracted you to teaching and then specifically how you started teaching at Adams State? Again, I've been involved in women's health, and so much of women's health is education. So I, I, I was drawn to that because um, I love educating. When I was at the University of New Mexico, and I was faculty there for over 20 years, I um, did a lot of teaching of medical students, family practice residents, first year OBGYN residents, some nursing, and of course the nurse midwifery students, uh, both didactically as well as clinically. I've taught nursing in a few different places, University of Maine, a community college in Albuquerque, as well as UNM. So my father was a teacher, my brother was a teacher, my uncle was a teacher, my son uh, is a certified math teacher, although he's a hockey coach at this point in time, but um, it, I think education's in my genes. So when did you move to the Valley? What attracted you to the area? Well, and then I, had, I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico for, oh, about 25 years. And it just kept getting bigger and more violent. And of course, being a sexual assault nurse, the violence was in my face. So I wanted to get out. I love the mountains. I love the rural areas. And so I started looking for a job, um, and I wanted to teach. I, it came down to two places. I, I was offered a position as a faculty at Tufts University, teaching medical students. And I was offered a position at Adams State College, and I just didn't feel as though I belonged out east. Mm -hmm. So although I would have made at three times as much money at Tufts, um, I chose Adams State. And a lot of people say, oh, well, the cost of living. Well, this was in Springfield, Massachusetts, which mm -hmm. is a very depressed living was really quite comparable mm -hmm. to, to um, the San Luis Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, what year was this? What year did I come to the Valley? 2008. Yeah. So what were some of your first impressions? What did you start teaching? How, how did that go for you? Well, I was hired as full-time faculty in the nursing department. When I first came on board, I was only teaching in the RN to BSN program. So those folks that had, were registered nurses who wanted a bachelor's degree. 
And I had a pretty light load, but we were also developing the four-year BSN program. So although my load, my credit load was light initially, sometimes I worked 80 to 100 hours in a week, but that may have been even more once the program started. Once the four-year BSN program started, there was essentially two faculty, uh, myself and another woman, and we taught almost all the courses in the RN to BSN as well as the uh, four-year bachelor's nursing. There were three nurses in the department for at least one semester, the director and then the two faculty members. Was that going well for you? Did you encounter some well, challenges? When did there there were some challenges? In fact, Danny, um, when I read that ASU throws its people down the memory hole, um, you talked about transitioning in that and mentoring. Well, I supposedly had a mentor, but it was very evident to me that whenever I asked her a question, the body language was such that I was annoying her. I was disturbing her, interrupting what she was doing, and I'm not going to get into what she was doing. It was not necessarily work for Adam State. I really related to, you know, the, the lack of mentoring because I, you know, when you get that kind of reaction from a person, you, you stop asking them. So did you sort of feel like you were on your own? I mean, you, you read into this person's demeanor that they weren't really interested in mentoring you. So did you just kind of go forward without their uh, guidance? or did Pretty you see much. Okay. Pretty much. Was there, yes. Were there other people that you tried to go to to get questions answered or to get well, assistance? Well, at that time, uh, the director of the program at that time was a lovely woman that um, was always very kind to me. And so she was someone that perhaps helped you when your designated mentor did not? Well, she didn't really have the knowledge to, to help me with the things I needed help with. It was so you, mostly the, yeah. the technology. I had never taught online before. I had never used a lot of the programs before. Um, I had taught lots previously, but never like the technological world was very different than, than what I encountered at Adams State. So, you know, I had a lot to learn. So those sound like some challenges you had initially. Mm -hmm. Were you able to kind of move past that, figure out things on your own in the school of hard knocks? or Pretty much, yes. And once that was the case, did things improve? Because I understand you're not teaching there now, so I'm, I'm trying to get to well, the series of events that you were teaching and then you were no longer teaching. Right. I was full-time faculty for seven semesters and I was adjunct faculty for one semester. In that order? Uh, adjunct, yes. I was asked to come back and teach a course um, after I had resigned from the full-time Oh, position. lucky you. I'm interested to know why you even came back, but let's get into that Why? A because bit. I support the nursing program. I believe that Alamosa needs a, a program that graduates uh, nurses with their bachelors. I was very fond of the students, and so I did it for the students. Mm -hmm. You taught for seven semesters as a full-time faculty. Yes. I guess by my count, that's three and a half years. Correct. What led to your resignation? I mean, it sounds like well, you I decided to Well, I kept thinking to things were going to get easier. And as I say, it was not unusual for me to work 80 hours in a week. I basically, all I did was work. And Did you find yourself working on things that, that were improving, or did you find that you felt like you were spinning your wheels and things weren't getting done? Well, it was, a, what would happen is I would develop a course, and I'd teach it maybe a semester or two, and then the curriculum would change. So then I'd be developing another course. What really broke the camel's back was when I was scheduled to work 11, 12-hour night shifts within a 14-day period, in addition to teaching an online course, in addition to running labs. So that is pretty much not possible. Yeah. Now, I was able to arrange it so I did not work the whole 11. I think it was about seven shifts. We're talking night shifts, six at night to six in the morning, so 12 hours. I mean, you were salaried, but a part yes. of me is still thinking, this is a crazy number of hours. Well, for I don't know if I made minimum wage, actually, if I were to, to do it by the hour. Right. Um, but I was salaried. I mean, and that I agreed to that. Yeah. So, And what really bothered me was that that didn't have to be it happened about a week before I found out that 
I was told about a week before I needed to do it. Mm-hmm. I had done a lot of leg work for clinical placement the semester before that, and then a clinical coordinator was hired. I gave her all that information. She never followed up on any of it and denied I ever gave it to her. And I'm still kicking myself I didn't make copies. And it was mostly handwritten, not on a computer that I could retrieve it. Mm-hmm. So I was really thrown under the bus. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I did it. But at that point, I wrote my resignation that I would not be returning the following semester. Did you kind of realize that all at once, or was this kind of a process of saying... No, it was a process. I knew it was very abnormal for a person to be expected to do as much as what was expected of me. Mind you, I am... I throw myself into my work. Mm -hmm. I'm very conscientious. And had I been less conscientious, I probably would not have worked so hard. But um, I mean, is it possible that you could have said, hey, I, I just can't do this. Can we figure out another way rather than necessarily soldiering on and, and doing it even though it kind of burned you out? Um, like, did you feel obligated by your employer to do this or was this something you took you up? You know, I, I can't blame anyone but myself okay. and also my commitment to making this nursing program one that I would be proud of helping develop sure. and teaching. And I'm very passionate about nursing. I think nurses are um, heroes. I was in Boston recently and on one of the subways. They have big signs honoring nurses, and, and one says nurses are heroes. And nurses are not appreciated. They put up with an awful lot between um, administrators and doctors and patients. and um, But I, I, I think there's, nursing is one of the most important professions. And the yeah. way you say that, it almost sounds like you're talking about teaching for a lot of the same trappings and a lot of the same experiences. And so it sounds like you were engaged in both at the same time. And those are both professions that are underpaid and often under-recognized and under They're paid better now than they used to be, but certainly nursing faculty uh, are not paid what they're worth. And it's not just Adam State. I, I think that's pretty much across the board. But it's a woman's profession. Yeah. And it's be, that's becoming less and less. But if you look at teaching, it's a woman's profession. And any woman's profession does not get paid the same as a traditional male profession. So you wrote a letter of resignation. Yes. Um, how did that transition go? Because it sounds like you were taking on so many responsibilities that at that point almost no one else had the wherewithal to to transition on to them. So as you left, what happened to your workload? How was that? Well, I thought it was interesting that it was in September that I said that I would not be returning in January, and there was not even an ad placed for my replacement for I don't know how many months, if not a full semester. Did they just not believe you, or why would they not um, advertise sooner? I don't know. I mean, that that was it was out of my hands. It had nothing to do with me, so I, I don't know. I thought I thought it was rather interesting. Was there any effort made to understand, you know, why this letter of yours was written or what could be done to address the concerns that you had? They were never addressed, no. And and again, the the, uh, ASU throwing its people down the memory hole, you you mentioned exit interviews. I certainly never had an exit interview. If you did, if this were it, because maybe one of the, the byproducts of this podcast series is essentially conducting exit interviews, uh, what would some of your observations or recommendations be? I don't feel as though the administration adequately supported the nursing department. I, I don't think the administration realized just how hard the faculty in that department were working. Because it wasn't just myself who was working very hard. I mean, you're certainly describing a phenomenon that we've heard and written about before at Watching Adams, where people are asked to do more and more with less and less, that positions aren't refilled and their, their co-workers are just essentially asked to kind of pick up the slack. And, you know, that, that seems to be continuing to this day. Not having a really supportive mentoring program was uh, an early obstacle that you encountered. Um, it sounds like also there were issues with the amount that you um, felt that you essentially had to work to be able to keep things running under those circumstances, uh, and that there wasn't adequate Uh, support or compensation for nursing faculty. Any other stepping back 
recommendations or issues that, that you would see resulting from? Well, not only were we expected to teach and be involved in developing the program, we were also expected to continue doing clinical. So I would drive down to the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and cover 12-hour um, shifts. And I was expected to be involved in community and professional nursing organizations. Sure. Uh, I'm just imagining how this is analogous to other types of faculty because, of course, all faculty teach uh, at Autumn State something like a 4-4 load. Uh, during the regular year, uh, and then they're also expected to serve on committees and other university service, Correct. as well as uh, publications Correct. and professional scholarship. So in your case, would clinicals be essentially some of that professional scholarship in your field, or what would... No, that would be part of the job. I'm talking about being involved in the New Mexico Nurses Association. Um, being involved in committees on campus. I was involved, for instance, one of the committees was the AIDS Committee. I gave professional talks at some of the conferences that were sponsored by uh, the hospital. And this is while you were teaching four courses a semester? Um, was it four courses? So we were initially on the block schedule. Mm -hmm. And, and again, I keep going back to that article about uh, ASU throwing its people down the memory bank. It seems to me that Adam State does not want anyone to rock the boat. If you do not agree with the powers that be, things can become rather hostile. Before the program even started, I said, this block schedule is not a good idea. Well, that was not okay to say, uh, because the powers that be and interestingly, those with power at Adam State, probably any other institution as well, are not necessarily the ones with the title of power. Interesting. And I did find that in, in that department. It's, it's almost like you're a troublemaker if you speak out and express your opinion. So you made your concerns known that you felt the block schedule was not a good idea. What was the reason that you gave? The reason I gave was it was just not enough time to absorb all that information. Three weeks, so the students, it was three and a half hours, something like that, Monday through Friday for three weeks. And they would only just take that one course. Yeah, I've, I've heard that criticism of the well, block schedule before. they no longer have the block schedule. It yeah. showed to be a failure. So, so they're now back to the <laughs> traditional. They, they could have listened to you to begin with. But, but I was just the new kid in the block, and um, I, I find that if you if I spoke out, I, I got feedback that some found me intimidating, <laughs> and which was interesting because I've never thought of myself as intimidating. Just but, for those of us listening to this podcast, I'm sitting here with Elaine, who's probably also about 5'2", five, 5'3". Five, I'm 5'4", excuse you're, me. You're 5'4", <laughs> all right. So uh, Elaine is a, is a rather petite build like myself. Uh, like myself, she's been accused of being intimidating for being outspoken. Um, but it, it's interesting to me because you weren't trying to agitate simply for the, the sake of causing trouble, right? You had specific... Not, no, no. I, I do know someone that really likes to stir the pot, Danny. But I'm, I'm not one that is very confrontational. I'm not one that, that enjoys an argument. But so, really, no, I was just stating yeah. my experience. Now, one of my children went to a school that had the block schedule in high school, and it was the, bored to death. It was very difficult to try to keep students' attention for over three hours. Of course, we'd take breaks, and I would try to do activities, but still, it's an awful big chunk of time. You zone out. I think it's 20 minutes. I think the research says 20 minutes kind of is about optimal. It is about how long someone can actually listen. Module. Yes. Yeah. Well, it sounds like they saw things your way eventually, but perhaps with no credit to you. That being the case, uh, after you brought that feedback to their attention, you were, you kind of you felt like you were being labeled as intimidating or as a troublemaker. Did you sort of cease and desist in your observations at that point? No, no. I, I continue to voice my opinions. So I did not cease and desist, but I realized that my opinion was not really considered seriously. Uh, another thing, I saw students admitted into the program that had no business being admitted. I do not want to blame the nursing department on them. There was pressure from the administration to have X number of students. So the nursing department has accepted people that really weren't ready. One 
One young woman hardly spoke English. I'm sure she was intelligent. I was against admitting her, but no one, I said, look, we're setting this poor child up for, child, young woman, up for, for failure. Let's give her another year to learn English and then accept her. Yeah. But, you know, I guess it all comes down to the dollar sign. And she was accepted, and I think she may have lasted two courses. But she didn't complete the program. She didn't complete the semester. Yeah. Well, and this is, this is certainly a bind that schools like Adams State are in because they're trying to, you know, bridge the funding gaps by, by their admissions. Uh, but then, then you as faculty kind of have almost this perverse set of incentives whereby you can either continue to admit students and, um, and pass them, you know, uh, for promotional reasons because it helps keep your job intact. But you have to ask yourself, wait, for nurses, they can't leave without a certain set of standards and expectations because, you know, someone's life is going to be in their hands, right, at some point. Yes. So the nursing program has a hard set of uh, standards that have to be met, right? Isn't there some kind of a, a test that you have to yes. take to pass, irrespective of how you've done in your coursework at Adams Well, State? you to become a registered nurse, you can uh, graduate with a bachelor's and associate's degree in nursing. That doesn't make you a registered nurse. You have to take a national board. One of the courses I taught was probably one of my favorite ones was nursing ethics. One of the ethical obligations of a nursing faculty member is to not graduate anyone who may not be competent, who may not have the ability to take care of patients. Nurses make life and death decisions. I felt that as an ethical obligation, we cannot push students along and have them out there, you know, just not being competent. Do you ever, when you get up in the morning, thinking about some of the students you know are struggling, some of the students that you know may not make it, uh, given that they're underprepared for the program, did you ever wonder, if only I could be a better teacher? Is there some onus on me to, to help bridge the gap between the student who wasn't ready out of high school and wants to get there? That's why I work so hard. I, you know, I, no one could have worked any harder than I worked. I wanted everyone to succeed, but there were some people that really had no business being a, a BSN, RN program. Did you ever get pushback? Because I assume during your time there that there were some students who failed one of your classes, right? Because they weren't ready. They didn't complete the class. Would that be accurate to say? Let's just say by the, when I left, I was the only faculty who had ever failed anyone. I mean, does that say something about you as opposed to the students? I'm not easy. I work hard. I expect my students to work hard. Yeah. It wasn't that this student wasn't working hard. This student just wasn't capable of doing the work. She wasn't capable of being an RN. I didn't, I didn't believe in pushing her along. By the time I left, I made it very clear that we should not be giving any extra credit. They need to know the material. They need to sit those boards and pass. And so, ex even though they might get an A because of extra credit, doesn't mean they're going to pass their RN bo boards. So there was a policy for a semester or two while I was there that no extra credit would be given, although I have heard that that has been, was done again, mm. and now they're rethinking that as well. Yeah, I would say in most departments of which I'm aware, extra credit really is at the discretion of the individual faculty member. Uh, I certainly had many students who were sort of expecting extra credit, and I said, well, why don't we just focus on obtaining credit, you know, the actual way, uh, and then we won't have to deal with that. And it sounds like sometimes extra credit is used to paper over, you know, things that the students fell through that they really needed. And so no amount of extra credit is going to compensate for what the student needed to know on an exam or something like that. True. Did you ever get uh, pressure to have a certain threshold of students get a B or above or something like that where... I was pressured one time to pass a student um, and she was so close that I did. When you say you were pressured, was it by one of your superiors? Yes. Or? Okay. Because they had been made aware of the situation by the student? I believe so. I'm not quite sure. Maybe I did it. I mean, it's been a while now. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I did that one time. I did pass someone that probably shouldn't have been passed. Now, you don't have any students who are also student athletes, I'm yes, assuming? Yes. You did? We did. 
and they were the best students. That's good to hear. I can't say all. I mean, as a general, as a general rule, the student athletes. I think they are more disciplined than many other students. And we, yes, we had quite a number while I was there, and uh, many of them were, were the better students. That's good to hear. That's certainly an interesting perspective because I know other faculty who really have felt that uh, that student athletes really don't prioritize their academics at Adams State, but it may have something to do with the degree itself and maybe the, the specific sport that the athlete is there to play. We had a football player. You know, I think probably football has the worst... Uh, reputation. Um, for, reputation, that's yeah, the word I'm trying yeah. to use. Um, but we, we did actually have a, a football player who, who did graduate. Well, you know, I mean, and that probably speaks more to the individual students you know. Yeah, that person was pretty special. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at some of the, my notes here. You know, Danny, I didn't agree to do this to throw the nursing department under the bus. I agreed to do this because I want to support you. And you may be a lot of things, but you are not a violent person. And I am just appalled at you being banned from campus as a security risk. I often wonder what um, the previous chief of police, Joel Schutz, I believe his Joel name Schultz, was, yeah. thinks of this situation. Um, I don't know this chief of police. I do. Um, I know you do, but yeah. I don't. Yeah. So, but oh, uh, you mean the current one? The uh, yes. The, I was the, just saying that I know Joel, and we yes. communicate sometimes on Facebook. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I did know Joel not only from campus, but he was also a neighbor, and I understand he was fired. Um, and I heard that from him, and I said, why? I thought he did a great job, and he said, you know, I really don't know. Well, I appreciate you coming in today. Um, you know, it's not like the nursing program at Adams State is forlorn. It sounds like they've made some corrections or improvements. Well, I don't think I had anything to do with them changing to a traditional schedule. <laughs> what do you think it was that, that caused that uh, change? If it's not the, the faculty themselves saying this is not a good idea, it's because of the uh, RN pass rate. So students, the pass rate, some years have been good and some years have not. So I think they decided that the block schedule, that the students just were not able to really absorb the information um, during a block schedule. Uh, what was the thinking, given that the rest of the, the school is not on a block schedule, what was the thinking behind the nursing program deviating? Well, I, if I understand correctly, there was only one other nursing program in the country that had a block schedule. And again, the powers that be had in their minds that this was going to be show the world what a great idea the block schedule was for nursing and would put, you know, Adam State on the map for the nursing uh, program. Uh, I guess I'll close by asking, you talked earlier about how, how important you feel it is for the San Luis Valley to have a nursing program, so much so that you actually went back and taught as an adjunct even after resigning, it sounds like for that reason. So I guess my question is, in terms of strategic growth for the university moving forward, what could they do to further support and, um, and grow what you see as an important need for this region? When I think back on that other faculty member and I being the really the only two uh, teaching in two different RN programs, I think, how did they, they, whoever they is, is as the administration, I think that two people could teach in these two programs um, and, and have a life. I hardly ever did anything at Adams State. You know, you can go to the theater and the concerts. I would be at, in my office at 11 at night. While there were concerts and all going on, I would have loved to have gone to, but there was just too much work. I worked all weekends. Uh, I did get to the gym occasionally. <laughs> Maybe you could have made a statement about overworked nursing faculty by bringing your work to the concert and sitting there typing <laughs> oh, away. Oh, that would have like, been rather rude. <laughs> I know. <laughs> of course. Um, you know, and you certainly are not the only department that has just a couple of people trying to hold everything together. We have 
I'm thinking of at least one department of one person. Um, they get absorbed into another larger department, but you know they they still are responsible for teaching all the classes that would go into that degree plan. Um, or departments that have you know been pounding on the desk for a decade now to get another tenure line position in their department. And uh, there was one faculty who remarked last spring, "I wish it was easy." for us to hire a, f a new faculty member as it is for athletics to hire a new coach. I'm afraid it's not just Adam State though with the athletics really becoming more important than the academics in universities. At that said, my son was a, uh, a hockey player at a college in Michigan. He's now a hockey coach at that college in Michigan. So um, I think athletics is a very important part of the college experience. But the money that is put into athletics seems to be taking first place over money being put into academics. And again, I don't think it's just Adam State. I, I think this is across the United States. Well, it was great to have you join us today. Um, anything else you'd want to add or final thoughts or reflections? Uh, I wish Adam State lots of luck. I think it is a very important institution in the Valley. I think uh, there's some fabulous people that are there. I wish I could put my finger on what is wrong, but there is something wrong, and I'm not sure what it is. I wish I knew, and then maybe it could get fixed. But again, I don't want to throw Adam State or the nursing department under the bus by doing this interview, yeah, because it, it uh, is a very worthwhile institution um, in, in this valley. Well, thank you for joining us today. Okay, Danny. Great. Thank you.